Hi, I'm Monique Kilkenny. I'm an associate professor and head of the National Stroke Data Linkage Program within the Stroke and Aging Research Group at the School of Clinical Sciences at Monash Health, Monash University in Victoria, Australia. With my colleagues and my team, we're going to give you four examples of stroke using, using linked data. The data spine for the National Stroke Data Linkage Program is the Australian Stroke Clinical Registry. This registry was set up over 10 years ago in 2009 and collects information on patients with stroke, either ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke, as well as transient ischemic attack. This registry collects information not only on process of care, whether a patient was treated in a stroke unit or is a received uh, clot busting drug or discharged on appropriate medications. It also includes information on outcomes as well as 9180 day outcomes. This registry follows national clinical quality registry um, standards. Uh, within the registry, we have um, steering committees, management committees, and we have policies and procedures for the setup of the, of the committee for data access and for privacy purposes. We use an opt-out approach and we use waiver for deaths in hospital. The data is collected on the Australian Stroke Data Tool, and which is an integrated stroke data management. So it collects the information not only on the registry, but also the audit program and also for some clinical trials. As I mentioned before, we also collect information on stroke outcomes at 90 to 1 to 80 days. And the information we collect on uh, at follow-up includes um, place of residence, uh, whether the patient was uh, readmitted into hospital. And we also collect information on their quality of life, which is um, based on the EQ5D um, tool, which has got five dimensions, which will be explained later in, in a number of the presentations. We also collect information on the visual analog scale, which uh, you can see on the right hand side here is the phenomena. So zero is the worst imaginable health status and 100 is the best imaginable health status that the stroke survivors report at 90 to 180 days after their stroke. As you can see here, this is a progress. We have nearly 100 hospitals participating in the, in the registry and over 110,000 registrants and around half of these registrants have completed the 90 to 180 day follow up. And our response rate for the, the patient reported outcomes is around 70%. So that is excellent. And if you can, you can see here that um, the registry has grown exponentially. We started in Victoria with you know, 10, 10 hospitals and it's grown to the majority of the Eastern Board of Australia. And now we've, we've got every state, state participating in the registry except the Northern Territory. And you can see at the top there, our opt-out rate is quite low, it's around 2%. So I'll go into the next presentation. And the first presentation will be Dr. Jusip Kin. Thank you. So, hi, hi everyone. My name's Jusup. I am a research fellow at the Stroke and Aging Research Group. And today I'll be talking to you about our landmark study, the Stroke 123 uh, project. So, in the Stroke 123 data, data from uh, in the Stroke 123 study, data from the OSCAR were linked to hospital administrative data sets. And this is the paper here on the left that details the process and provides an overview uh, of the data that, that were collected as part of the project. Briefly, the study included over 15,000 patients admitted with stroke or transient ischemic attack between 2009 and 2013 at 40 hospitals in four states of Australia. All hospital contacts occurring five years prior to the event registered in the OSCAR were obtained. Uh, and the advantage of this was that we could identify comorbid conditions using the ICD-10 coding associated with those prior hospital contacts. We have also obtained hospital contacts for at least one year after the event registered in the OSCAR in order to look at the frequency and types of readmissions after a stroke or TIA. Now, this is probably the study that highlights the reason why we pursued th this data linkage the best. Uh, this was 
published earlier this year in, in Stroke. The main aim of this study was to investigate factors associated with readmissions after stroke or transient ischemic attack. And in this table on the right, um, we reported the comorbidities of patients based on whether they had all caused readmissions or unplanned readmissions. And again, these, uh, these comorbidities were based on ICD-10 codes associated with the hospital contacts in the five years prior. Some of these comorbidities are likely to be underestimated because of the way that they are recorded in medical records um, and in turn uh, in the hospital administrative data sets. But we summarise this comorbidity data using the Charleston Comorbidity Index. This, is, this has been shown to be reliable when using hospital administrative data sets as a measure of comorbidity. In another part of this manuscript, we were able to show the association between the Charleston Comorbidity Index and readmissions. Using this data, we were also able to conduct some research on patients with intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, now, research on patients with intracerebral hemorrhage are limited because they only make up 15% of all stroke and their outcomes are much worse than patients with ischemic stroke, which makes it difficult to con difficult uh, for these patients to be consented in, in studies. In this study, we were able to look at patients with intracerebral hemorrhage and see what they were hospitalized with prior to this intracerebral hemorrhage. We found that previous readmissions were most commonly related to diseases of the circulatory system, but unexpectedly, we found many were coming in with a previous admission related to neoplasms, around 6 to 8%, and diseases of the digestive system, around 6 to 12%, as you can see in this figure on the, on the right. And in our multivariable models, what we found was that neoplasms were associated with a greater hazard of, of death after intracerebral hemorrhage. Another question we've looked at um, looked into using the stroke one, two, three data set is, uh, is the prescription of antihypertensive medications. Using these data, we've been able to show that younger patients with fewer, co fewer comorbidities were likely to be prescribed antihypertensive medications after their stroke, despite there being a general recommendation for prescription after stroke in clinical, in clinical guidelines at the time. Uh, at the time these patients were admitted. For the stroke one, two, three cohort in one state of Australia, we also obtained clinical costing data. Uh, and clinical costing is the process of determining the cost of the resources used by patients during their hospital stay. In Australia, this is based on information on the patient that is documented in medical records this information is then coded by health information managers and clinical coders and entered into an electronic system that allocates costs to a patient. And having this data provides us an opportunity to investigate care received during the admission. In this subgroup, the median cost of all cases was around $8,000. As you can see here on the left, the majority of people incurred medical and nursing costs nursing costs, and this was the majority of costs incurred for these patients, around $1,500 and $2,500 respectively. We also found that a minority incurred critical care costs, and this was a high cost relative to other cost buckets, around $3,000. By linking this clinical costing data to the OSCAR, we've also been able to look into answering novel questions such as costs related to stroke unit care as I'm trying to demonstrate here on the right. And stroke unit care is one of the treatments monitored using the OSCAR data. And for more information on this, please tune into my other presentation at this virtual conference. Uh, and, and I'll take, I'll ask the next speaker, Lemmy, to uh, speak about his data linkage project related to ambulance. My name is Amina Dablemi and I'm a PhD candidate within this group. This aspect of the symposium focuses on the pre-hospital environment and gives an overview of the benefits of linking 
ambulance records to the clinical registry. One of the limitations for provision of thrombolysis, a cord busting drug used for treatment of patients with ischemic stroke, is delayed presentation to the hospital. Much like elsewhere around the world, Australian patients are, with stroke are, not, are no exceptions with just under two thirds of the patients with stroke arriving beyond the thrombolysis, thrombolysis time window of four and a half hours. We have various data systems available from different organizations that can help us understand why there may be delays in promptly arriving at hospital or why there may be gaps in provision of treatment for patients with stroke. Our objective was to assess the feasibility of linking data from the clinical registry and ambulance records. Through this linkage, we can determine the factors that influence the pre-hospital and hospital phases of acute care in relation to patient outcomes and identify opportunities to improve access to high quality stroke care. The ambulance records are of a great benefit um, supplementing the clinical information collected in the OSCAR. Firstly, Ambulance Victoria is the sole provider of emergency medical services in the state of um, Victoria, here shaded in blue, and it covers an area of approximately 230 square, uh, 230,000 square kilometers. This is unique to Australian states and territories, unlike in other parts of the world where multiple emergency services um, service a defined geographical area. Ambulance Victoria collects both operational data, which are captured through a computer dispatch system, and clinical information, which are captured by paramedics um, during patient management or patient care on the field. So information is captured throughout the whole process from when a patient calls for an ambulance to arriving at the hospital. And therefore, this information, um, we can, and therefore using this information, we can look at patient management by paramedics, um, time intervals, as well as important practices, such as the use of assessment tools in the pre-hospital environment or notifications of arrival to the hospital um, by paramedics. So we can, this allows us to explore um, key practices within the environment, within the pre-hospital environment, adding a valuable source of information not available in the, um, in the OSCAR or the Stroke Clinical Registry. So for this project, we linked data, uh, the linked data included data from the Australian Stroke Clinical Registry, the National Death Index, Ambulance Victoria, as well as the Victorian Hospital Admissions and Presentations data. Patient level data from the OSCAR between 2015 and 17 were provided to data linkage units where these data were linked using probabilistic iterative methods. Using the OSCAR as the source of patients with the hospital confirmed stroke or TIA, and by linking this with the ambulance records, we can identify some of the factors that influence the hospital, uh, hospital and the pre-hospital and hospital care for patients with stroke and, and determine their long-term outcomes. And so we use this data to describe the uh, use descriptive statistics to, to look at some of the processes of care by um, within the within the pre-hospital environment um, by ambulance staff. The final cohort consisted of just under 5,000 cases of stroke with under a half of these cases recorded in female patients who had a median age of 73 years. Lights and sirens were dispatched for 81% of the patients and the highest transport uh, priority was used for 51% of, of these patients as well. The paramedics used the Melbourne Ambulance um, Stroke Scale tool in, um, uh, uh, for 81% of the patients and documented hospital arrival um, in 44% of the cases um, transported to, to, to the hospital.
Amongst those patients with a stroke or TIA diagnosis, according to the registry, call dispatches correctly identified 56% of them as having a stroke, whereas the paramedics um, identified 68% of these patients. For both paramedics and call dispatchers, fewer women were identified as having a stroke. This was similar to those patients who had um, stroke onset beyond four and a half hours. Those with less severe strokes were more commonly identified than those with more severe stroke. I use the ability to work on admission because this is a variable that is used as a proxy for stroke severity. So these, the, these current evidence are novel for Australia and they provide, uh, they provide important information that uh, they provide important evidence that ambulance records can be successfully linked to clinical registry data. Just as in the, uh, just as in, the in the patient journey within the hospital, in the pre-hospital um, environment, there are also multiple stages involved that can be targeted to improve stroke care. And these data provides an opportunity to understand not only the patient, but the clinical and system factors um, associated with care management in the pre-hospital environment. And I would like to introduce my uh, the, the next presenter, Dr. Mudin Olaya. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Moedin. I'm a research fellow at the Stroke and Aging Research Group. And I'll be talking about the Polar GP project. Um, general practitioners are well placed to provide long-term care for uh, the uh, management of people with stroke in the community. However, there's limited um, evidence on how people with stroke are being managed in Australia and general practice. Um, current leakage studies do not provide uh, sufficient information on how people with stroke uh, are being managed in the uh, community. Therefore, um, person level linkage of uh, Oscar and general practice data sets will provide new and important information on the management of um, people with stroke in, in the general practice. The additional benefit, benefit of using the general practice and data set is that it provides information about the medication prescribed rather than the medication dispensed. Also, we will be able to obtain data on pathology and with this, we'll be able to track um, the risk factor profile of uh, each patient. So the aims of this study are to assess the feasibility of linking the OSCAR and the general practice data sets, and also to describe the, the level of GP adherence to evidence-based guidelines um, for the long-term management of stroke, and also to assess the association between uh, the GP adherence and patient outcomes at within 12 months of discharge. So we plan to undertake a retrospective cohort study of um, adult survivors of stroke or transient ischemic attack, that is TIA, uh, residing in the Australian state of Victoria. Uh, for the first time in Australia, we'll be undertaking a person level linkage of a um, data set from the National Stroke Registry, that is the OSCAR, with the Polar GP data set. Uh, the main exposure variable will be adherence to four guideline recommended uh, uh, practices for the long-term management of, uh, of stroke, and this include assessment of risk factors, reviews of medication, uh, use of care plan by the GP, and then uh, team care arrangement by the GP. Our outcomes will be um, a survivor at up to one year post-stroke and attainment of uh, risk factor targets. Specifically, we'll be looking at um, targets for the control of um, blood pressure, lipids, body weight, glucose, smoking, and kidney function. Data on outcomes will be obtained from both the OSCAR and the uh, Polar datasets. So there will be two linkage units, the OSCAR office, and the custodian of, of um, the OSCAR data, and the outcome health, the custodian of the Polar uh, data. And the OSCAR comprises data on acute care, for approximately uh, 25,000 registrants living in, uh, in the state of Victoria, why um, the polar data set comprises uh, general practice data uh, from approximately 1,000 general practices, uh, which represents 27% of uh, general practices in the state of Victoria. 
As you can see, uh, linkage variables and the project ID will be securely transferred from the Oscar office to the outcome health, after which uh, both linkage units will transfer the identified uh, content and data in a secure manner to the Monash uh, secure environment, where uh, researchers will be able to assess and analyze the, the data. Uh, for the linkage process, we'll be using the Orca Action uh, software. Uh, this software uh, is, is securely identifies and, and data sets, thereby allowing passing level linkage between the data sets. We anticipate that that will be a generation of two linkage and keys uh, based on the combinations of the linkage variables, as you can see. Uh, we are hoping that we'll be able to achieve at least 95% linkage of the OSCAR registrants available in the polar data sets. So we will use a longitudinal analytic approach where uh, each patient will be followed from a, uh, for our data analysis, we'll be, we'll be using a longitudinal analytic approach where each patient will be followed from a hospital discharge to death or up to one year post discharge, whichever came first. We use a standard descriptive statistics to summarize the level of GP adherence to the recommended practices. We also use a multi-level regression models to determine the association between GP adherence and patient outcomes. And also the same model will be used to identify factors associated with GP adherence and then patient outcomes. Um, from this study, we hope that we'll be able to uh, define this from this study will be essential for describing how people with stroke are being managed uh, in Australian general practice. And also we'll be able to provide evidence that may inform strat strategies to better individualize uh, the care for people with stroke in the community. And I will now hand you over to uh, uh, Lachlan to talk about the precise project. Thank you. Thank you, Medine. Hello, everyone. My name is Lachlan Daly, and I'm a PhD candidate from Monash University, Australia. And in this section of today's talk, I'll present an overview of the precise data linkage project and how routinely collected data in Australia can be used to ascertain medication dispensing and doctor visits. So a bit of a background from one of our earlier pilot data linkage projects where we linked information from the OSCAR with the nationwide prescription refill and Medicare claims data sets. And in this study, we found evidence to suggest that the use of secondary prevention medications after stroke is suboptimal. And in these pie charts, we can see that nearly 20% of patients are withheld secondary prevention medications in the year after discharge. And more alarmingly, up to one third of patients discontinued their medications within one year, potentially placing these patients at a greater risk of recurrent vascular events. And this pilot research really highlights the need for further work in this space and a greater understanding of potentially low cost interventions, which could be implemented to improve medication adherence after stroke. So this brings me to the PRECISE project, which um, was a large data linkage study, um, linking uh, information from a cohort of OSCAR registrants located in Victoria and Queensland, uh, as shown in the blue states in the map of Australia above. And briefly, we linked uh, information from these registrants with routinely collected data um, from the Medicare Benefit Schedule, the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme, the National Death Index, hospital admissions and emergency presentations in both states, and also the National Aged Care Data Clearing House. For a subset of patients who were admitted in 2016, we also conducted a cross-sectional survey to understand their patterns of treatment and care after stroke. And this survey was also linked with these uh, range of routinely collected data sources. So the aims of the precise study were to compare the long-term health outcomes of patients based on whether they received chronic disease management and also their disability status. And the secondary aims of the study were to compare differences in adherence to secondary prevention medications based on the receipt of these chronic disease management plans, and also to determine the cost effectiveness of different models of primary care based on our disability status. So for today's talk, I'm going to focus on our second uh, 
on our first uh, secondary aim, which is to compare differences in adherence to secondary prevention medications. So this is a quick overview of our study design and how we will be using information from different uh, sources of uh, data. So for our study, we're going to use data from the National Death Index to exclude patients who may have died before the outcome period. And we're also going to use data from the National Aged Care Data Clearinghouse to identify patients who were in aged care as these patients are ineligible to receive chronic disease management plans. During the exposure period, that is between six and 18 months after discharge, we're going to look in the Medicare claims data to see whether patients received a chronic disease management plan. And in the subsequent, subsequent 12 months, we'll use the PBS data to understand whether or not patients adhered to their medications. Using the variety of linked data sources, we'll be able to understand important patient, clinical and health system factors. Firstly, in the hospital admissions and ED data, we'll be able to understand uh, patient demographics and comorbidities using the ICD-10 AM codes. And in the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, we'll also be able to look at patients' pre-existing levels of medication adherence and their comorbidities. Um, we'll also be able to look at the continuity and regularity of GP, specialist and allied health visits using Medicare claims data, and also whether or not patients who received certain home care, uh, aged care pa packages may have better or worse medication adherence. And also uh, important patient and clinical fa factors collected uh, as part of the OSCAR uh, related to the index stroke or TIA. So ultimately, the findings from this precise project will provide real-world evidence of the effectiveness of chronic disease management on long-term outcomes after stroke or TIA, including adherence to secondary prevention medications. Overall, this project shows that data linkage is a cost-effective strategy for researchers to investigate the effectiveness of interventions as well as patient outcomes across the continuum of care. Thanks so much. And now I'll pass back to Monique Kilkenny to conclude today's symposium. So thank you, Lockie, and thank you, Medine and Lemmy and Jusip for providing examples for a case study for the National, National Integrated Data Platform for Stroke for Australia. So as you can see, the data are already available and they potentially are cost effective. For the projects, for example, the juice that presented, the strike one, two, three, it took us four years to receive the data. So it does take time to receive these data sets. And with the precise data set that was presented by Lockheed, it has been taken us two and a half years to go through the ethics applications and data, data applications in order to receive these data. But there are lots of advantages to receiving these data. It adds value to the registry. It adds value, so by linking to the death index, we can actually have in find information on looking at the survival for those patients who receive the clot busting drug thrombolysis. We can do validation studies. We can validate what the clinical diagnosis in, in the registry is compared to how it's coded in the administrative data to see whether we're catching all the strokes in the registry as well as in the administrative data to monitor the incidence of stroke in Australia. It supports various study designs. With the, the study that was presented on the precise, that's a comparative effectiveness study. And with what JUICIT presented with stroke one, two, three, we can do cost effectiveness studies as well. We can look at comparisons between those patients who were treated in a stroke unit versus those patients who weren't treated in a stroke unit. And does that change survival? Does that change whether a patient is readmitted after stroke? And we wouldn't be able to do this without um, using these linked data sets. Also, these uh, large linked data sets allow us to uh, undertake research into rare events or small subpopulations, such as Aboriginal. Um, Udine is, is undertaking some work in looking at Aboriginal uh, quality of care, quality of life and process of care and outcomes. And in the future, we're going to also look at ethnic differences in quality of care and outcomes for patients who are from a non-English non speaking background. 
So these advances going up the tree with the, the data platform, the strain stroke registry at the bottom, we can actually look at the whole stroke journey. We can go from the ambulance right up to whether a patient died and then anything in between, whether they're admitted into hospital, whether they received medications. And as you can see, this massive data sets that we're, we've accumulated over the last um, 10 years, we've got nearly 22 million records where we can evaluate um, this whole stroke journey. Just a plug, we actually have a national stroke data linkage interest group. And if you um, Google that, you'll be able to have a look at what our group is doing around Australia um, in data linkage in stroke. And I'd just like to acknowledge all the supporters of the registry, as well as all the, the government support we've had in undertaking these projects, as well as the Stroke Foundation. And thank you also to all our team at the Stroke and Aging Research at uh, Monash University and the Flory who managed all the registry data. Thank you.